I am speaking with Chastin Whitfield, who is a really cool young woman doing a lot in the fishing industry. She runs a nonprofit and she also does a lot of competitive fishing, if I'm not mistaken. So Chastin, it is so great to speak with you. We have a mutual friend in Debbie Hansen, a great freshwater fishing captain in Southwestern Florida and all around woman. And, and uh, she told me so much about your story. And I think we connected on social media not too long ago. And I'm grateful you can share your story with my listeners today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, it's, you know, you don't really see a lot of this conversation. I don't know. I feel like if we're women in the outdoor industry, I feel like we need to do a better job of elevating women on podcasts because we don't see a lot of women guests sometimes or we see kind of people pick and choose women selectively. And any way that I can help give a platform to women like you, individuals like you who are doing great things in their community, I want to be able to do that, of course. But I think we have to do a better job of elevating emerging voices like yourself. And I'm glad we're able to talk today. Thank you so much. What got you into fishing? I think that backstory <laughs> is something everyone wants to know. Probably people who follow you are curious what led you to start doing this. Is it something you've been doing for a long time? Is it something you were introduced to later in life? So what is your fishing story? So I've fished my entire life. I actually live on a canal. So my backyard is a canal. So I just, when I used to run away when I was little, I'd get in my boat and take off. Um, so I've been fishing my entire life, but I didn't start like seriously fishing until summer of seventh grade. Um, I was a cheerleader at the time and all my friends were cheerleaders and they were like, Hey, we're going to do all-star cheer. And I was like, Oh, okay. Like that's like up here, like top, like level 10 and I'm like level three. So I was like, okay. Um, so I talked to my mom and she's like, well, there's a fishing tournament this weekend. Why don't you try it and just see how you like it, see what happens. So I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm going to fish the tournament and then go from there. So I fished the tournament and I got first. And um, after that, I picked up a first, my first sponsor and it just kind of snowball affected down to here. I don't know. It just kind of happened. And I was like, yeah, cheer, cheer can hold on. I, I like this. I'm like, I think fishing's going to get me somewhere. So here I am. And how many years has that been? Like a decade plus, a little bit more than a decade, you would say? I am not good at math. Let me count on my <laughs> I think that's was, probably at least 10 years, give or oh, 12. <laughs> oh, 12, yes. 12 to 13. Yeah, that, that seems like a long time. It's yeah. <laughs> you are, you just said you turned 21, which yes. is a great milestone. Welcome to, I guess, official adulthood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so, so you were kind of an early adopter in fishing. What they say is if you fish before you turn, the, I think, the age of 12, you're going to stick with the hobby for a lifetime. And I mean, that doesn't mean if you get into the sport later in life, you cannot develop a love of fishing, but all yeah. of the kind of early adopters before kind of those teenage years, it's really hard to kind of escape our fate into loving fishing. It's, it's unless you have a really bad experience, you're like, I have to forego doing all this. This was so terrible. But I would say most of us who got our start in fishing before the age of 12, 13, we stick with it. We've stuck out with it. Yep. I definitely say, it. yeah, 100%. I am stuck and I can't stop. <laughs> so it's an, it's, it's a strange addiction, but <laughs> what, what have been some of your favorite species to target? Um, my favorite fish is tarpon, that fish right there. <laughs> That's part of it right there. I love tarpon. I don't know why I just, it's a trophy fish. So like, if you catch one, you should like pat yourself on the back. Like that's pretty good. And I don't know what it is about them. I just love the adrenaline rush. And like, when I catch one, like when I first hook up, I literally black out. Like, I don't remember a thing. And people are like, what do you, what do you feel when you're reeling in a tarp? And I'm like, I don't remember. I have no idea. Like, I honestly don't remember hooking them. All I remember is like the, like them jumping. And then I'm like, oh crap, I have a fish. Like, I don't know. It's weird, but I love them so much. I just, they're so, they're huge creatures. And they were actually, there's a picture of them in the Bible. Is so they're actually yeah they're like old fish so when you catch one it's like this is pretty cool because they're so like everyone wants one and when you get one it's just like ah thank you <laughs> oh no it's hard to explain it's just they're so cool and they're so old and it's so awesome i don't know <laughs> 
kind of in a category of their own. When you look at them scientifically by their name, there's really no fish that compares to them. There is, I think maybe, what would you say? Shadfish kind of look like them. I don't know. If yes. You, but kind we, of the same texture. I, I'm not a scientist, so I can't say if they're sci uh, biologically related, but there is some similarities physically speaking, like when I see a shad, but obviously a tarpon is in a unique category of their own. Yes. <laughs> beautiful silver scales. And I can attest to the fact that they really do leave a mark on you as an angler because I wrestled one for the first time almost two years ago. And that sucker almost overpowered me going on, I think a concrete um, pylon and just outmaneuvered me. And I was like, I'm going to forget that <laughs> loss because yeah. of how overpowering that fish was. Oh yeah. It makes you want to target them again. So in my limited tarpon experience, like I know kind of what it is, a little bit of that taste of like, you want to get them and you want to catch them. And it's kind of a different standard for catching. Can you explain for people who are not familiar? Because it's kind of hard to, to successfully catch them, bring them onto your boat. And if they're over 40 pounds or I think it was over 40 inches, you do not want to bring them into the boat. Yeah. So it's actually illegal if they're, I think it's 35 inches. If they're 35 inches or bigger, you can't bring them into the boat because it'll stress them out and kill them. Um, but it depends on how strong you are. If you're super strong, then you can fight tarpon really all the way into the boat and you'll be, and you can hand, like, I love grabbing the face of a tarpon. Don't know what it is, but I just love grabbing the face and just seeing it. Like I actually grab it and pick it up and kiss it. And whenever you pick them up, like you just pick them up a little bit, like I'll lean down and I'll be like, Mwah, and they burp in your face. I've had like six tarpon burp in my face. So I'm like, all right, I guess that's, hey, you've stuck a hook in my mouth. And then they burp on me. I'm like, okay, that's fair. As <laughs> for chasing them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, like some people, they like to just jump them and they'll hook one and then they'll do that crazy jump and then they'll land and then they'll, it'll break off and they're like, oh, okay, we can go home now. I'm like, no, I want to get one in. I don't know. It's just uh, like, it's so accomplishing to just grab that thing by its face and be like, I just reeled in this 200 and something pound fish in. Because I'm only, I'm like 118. So if I catch a tarpon that's like 130, I'm like, I just did that. It's awesome. It's so cool. Yeah, it really is a bucket list fish for sure. And if you haven't pursued them or even just see them jump out of water, I've seen juvenile tarpon. When Debbie took me out for peacock bass fishing, we saw them breach the surface, jump out of the water. Yeah. Those little juvenile ones are really fun to catch. I didn't catch one. We may have had one on the line. But even those little ones are really exhilarating to pursue and target as well, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. The little ones are so much easier because you won't wake up the next morning sore. So <laughs> I actually, um, I caught, when I was 15, I caught a world record tarpon for a woman under 16. And it was 187 pounds. But I didn't kill it, so it didn't count. They were like, oh, well, you need to kill it, tag it. And I was like, how was I supposed to kill it? And they were like, oh, you need to... Um, get a crane. I was like, I would feel so bad killing a tarpon. Like those things are so old and they're so like well known and respected. I'm like, I, you couldn't, you couldn't pay me to do that. I'm not, I'm like, yeah, here's my picture. So I have a little picture. It's up on the fridge over there and it's world record IGFA tarpon. And so that was really cool. Why don't you talk about your nonprofit? Because with the love of fishing you've developed from what I've heard you say, especially on some of your TV appearances and also some of your musings on social media, you do a lot to give back. And that's kind of what drew me to your story. You help disadvantaged kids go out on the water and you formed a nonprofit as a result. So talk about your nonprofit and kind of your desire to, to give back and, and get people to gravitate towards fishing, especially if they may be encountering some health problems, maybe some disability problems and, mm -hmm. and what it means for you. So, um, way back when, when I did that first tournament, I came back to school and everyone was making fun of me. And I was like, why are you making fun of me? Like, I, I thought I did something good. Like I won. That's awesome. But everyone was making fun of me. So I'm like, what the heck? So, um, I fished another tournament a couple weeks after that and we had the check and I was looking at it and I'm like, I don't, I was 13 years old. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do with $500. So I gave it back to the charity and um, the guy, the announcer, he was like, you're going to what? And he had to turn his mic off and he's like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, no, I want to give it back. I want to give it back. It's fine. He's like, really? 
And I'm like, I don't know what to do with it. Give it back to, it was a, um, it was the fire charity tournament. So it was a tournament for the children's burn camp in Florida. So I'm like, give it back to these kids. They need it more than I do. And he was like, okay. So he announced it and he's like, she's going to donate her winnings back. And everyone like just kind of sat there. And I'm like, did I just do something bad? <laughs> I was like, what? And they were like, wow, thanks. So once that happened, I um, started getting a lot of people asking me like why I do what I do. And um, I just, I decided, I was like, no, I, I think I want to like get this out there. So I started teaching um, Girl Scouts and tackle stores and churches and all that. I would travel around to Title I schools and teach them how to throw a cast net and they th can throw a cast net on candy. So it'll, it'll get their attention. So they'll see candy and they're like, oh, so then they'll throw the cast net and then I'll also throw in some life lessons in there, like how to do what's right and to do what you love no matter whatever anyone else says. So I threw a little bit of that in there. It's like feeding a kid, like you want some candy, but hold on, here's some vegetables at the same time. <laughs> so I started doing that and then I got contacted by, um, on Anna Maria Island, the community center there. And they were like, hey, we want to do a fish camp. Can you direct it and all that? And I was like, yeah, sure, okay. I was like, I think I just turned 16 at this at the time. And there was this little boy who showed up in a wheelchair and I was like, that is the cutest little thing. It, like wheelchair is probably this big. Like he was four years old at the time. And I was like, hey, have you ever been in a boat before? And he's like, no, my wheelchair won't fit in a boat. So I just fish off the pier in the docks. And I was like, hold on. So I went up to his mom and I was like, can I take him fishing? And she's like, if you can find a boat. So I found a friend um, who can fit a wheelchair in his boat. Cause at the time my boat didn't fit a wheelchair. So I put him in the boat and we went fishing and the first fish he caught, his face lit up and I was like, oh, this is what I wanna do the rest of my life. I'm like, this is it, I'm stuck. This is what I wanna do. So since then I've taken probably 60, 70 kids out and I just, I, I can't stop. <laughs> I can't stop doing it. It's just, it's awesome. That is so great. Yeah, I've seen the pictures and they're just so touching and yeah just to see kids faces light up, especially with any ordeal they may be going through. It's just so nice to see with all the negative stuff we see on social media, doesn't matter what the topic is, but, it, but I feel like to see someone's face light up catching their first fish. And I think you showing them the rope, showing them that it's possible despite whatever obstacles they may have, maybe whatever disabilities they have, that they can still do this, even with a little bit of help and encouragement. And that must be- yeah really good. I mean, not so much about patting yourself on the back, but the fact that you're giving back and that these kids could possibly do this on their own, even with. Oh, yeah. Sense. Yeah. So when I try, like my little saying is um, they're not focused on like, uh, I took um, this one girl, she had sickle cell and she had a treatment like next week. And I'm like, do not worry about what's happening next week. All they're focusing on is catching that fish. So everything leaves their mind and they're just catch like re focusing on reeling in that fish. So they're like, they feel, uh, they feel normal for a couple minutes while they're catching that fish. That's my goal is to just let them reel in a fish, just be a kid and reel on the fish. And like these kids actually help me more than I help them. Like Easton, um, he was the boy I took fishing, the first kid I took fishing. And he had, um, he has spina bifida. And they said that he would never be able to walk again. So I'm over here, like all kids my age at the time were like, oh, well, I only got 80 likes on Instagram. And then they're like worried about social media and this, that stuff. And I'm like, there's a kid over here who's, people are telling him he's never gonna be able to walk again. And you're worried about Instagram? So that really put everything in perspective. And these kids actually changed, like they helped me more than anything, if that makes sense. No, it does. <laughs> No, for anything as profound as that, I, I think all of us have had that kind of moment if we've done some really nice charitable act. I think for me, I grew, grew out of my hangup. I think all of us were very spoiled when we were young. And I had a, there was an event that I hosted for Christmas time. And I was like, I don't want any presents anymore. I think it was my senior year of high school or junior year. And when you're giving back like that, I mean, and I've done it uh, helping kids of Navy SEALs, teaching them how to fish too. And I, it was just so profound and so gratifying just to help and and to give back and and you should absolutely have that feeling leaving it away from that event or, or that act that of kindness that you do feeling better about yourself not getting anything in return and just 
extending joy to people who want a little break from whatever toils they may be going through. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. That's exactly it. I took a, um, a girl fishing two, three weeks ago. Uh, she's 12 years old and she has neuroblastoma and she got diagnosed when she was five, I believe. And it's came back four or five times. So the, um, this was the, this is going to sound bad. This is the hardest kid I've ever taken. She has a month left. Um, they decided to stop the treatments. It's hurting her more. So I took her fishing and she's like, I just want to see dolphins. So I'm like, all right. And I'm like, well, I'm like, I, when I'm in a boat, I have to like try and fish fish. So I'm like, we're just going to hit this one dock right here. So we're catching these fish. And she's like freaking out about, she's like, oh my gosh. And she just grabs the fish and just holds it, just stares at it. And she's got all these pretty long nails and she's just staring at it. And I'm like, are you okay? She goes, this is so cool. And then like, we hear like a in the back and there's like three dolphin behind us. And she drops the fish in the water, runs over the back of the boat and watching the dolphin and seeing dolphins through her eyes is insane. Like I've never really had that experience before. So I was like, oh my, I'm like this, it was emotionally stress, like tiring. Like it was so, it was good, but yet it was so tough. Cause that's like just the thought, like the last thing she wanted to do was go see a dolphin. I'm like, ah, keep it together. But it felt so good. It, it sounds weird. It was so bad. It was so good. Well, I think maybe the challenge comes with it because you're going to be part of some of her last memories. Yeah. Pretty high burden to have. And you obviously brought her some joy during this really difficult time. Yeah. It's not because you were challenged by her. It's the fact that you were challenged by the fact that this life-changing event, this horrific end to this young life is happening and providing that momentary joy, giving her that little slither of happiness before Mm -hmm. her pass uh, upcoming passing uh, really is meaningful I, I think people I mean it, it can be challenging and you don't know what to do do you do the right thing do you give them everything that you try and, and do you fall short and if you saw I, I bet through her you saw the joy you saw the happiness despite her circumstances and probably she came away from that trip more satisfied than probably what she was expecting maybe yeah, she said that she's never, um, she said that, they, that they've been on like dolphin tour boats and whatnot, and uh, they'll be like, maybe like 40, 50 foot from one from dolphins, but in my boat, I got right up next to them, because she was like, oh, I want to see its eyes, and I'm like, whoop, right up next to them, and they're rolling, and we're going like this, and I'm like, you're going to see a dolphin, you might even be able to touch one, but we're going to see a dolphin. And it was like two, two big dolphins and like a little baby one just hanging out. The baby one was actually like jumping half out of the water. So she had her little GoPro and I was like, oh, thank you. I'm like, that is God. I was like, thank you so much. It was, it was so good. It was an amazing trip. I had, um, that's why we call it like Chasta Nation is, it's a group of anglers and companies that help me take these kids fishing. So um, my little nation came together and we got them uh, lunch at a local um, restaurant on the water here called Swordfish. And then we went um, to mini golf and they went mini golfing and they got to walk around a little, it's like a little, we call it Bridge Street. Mm-hmm. So it's like a little shop and it's right on the water and it's super cute. So she, they did mini golf and so many people pitched in to help. So I was like, what if I don't see any dolphins? So I had people out there texting me going, hey, there's dolphins over here, there's dolphins over here. I'm like, we found some. So it was, it was amazing. Just, and also just to see everyone come together and help this girl, it's just like mind blowing. Like it was so good. It was so good. Yeah, it sounded like the community was rallying behind her to ensure that she had one of her best days of her life. Yes, yeah. The beauty of charity. I think whenever, and, and that's the great, I think one of the, wonderful things that you witness here. I think only in America can you see so many people extend their kindness, whether it's someone experiencing cancer or homelessness or something, and you give them that little ounce of joy. And I'm a firm believer that outdoor activities do extend that joy to people who need it the most. And I think studies are coming out showcasing that fishing and all the different types of fishing are leading to that. And someone who may be having an emotional distress order, maybe going through cancer, they're much better off spending time outdoors. It's kind of a healing process in a sense. Uh, Sometimes 
than the treatment that they get, that if they can get that little ounce of outdoor activity, that they could feel a little bit better um, in their journey. Yeah, we call it saltwater therapy. My mom was actually diagnosed two, three years ago with uh, stage two breast cancer. And so she had to go through chemo and all that. And um, she said on her bad day, she would go sit out. We had like a little swing tiki hut thingy. And she said she would go sit out there and she would fall asleep and totally like not feel a thing. Like she would feel like crap inside. She'd go outside by the water and just sit and listen and just feel it. And she's like, I felt so much better. She, she went fishing. She's like on the verge of like passing out. She's like, I don't care. I'm going fishing. I'm like, okay. And she's like, it just made, made me feel so much better. I'm like, that is so cool. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Nature is healing. It, it has a lot of indelible qualities, really healing qualities. And obviously um, it can supplement treatment too, but I think sometimes there are these kind of out, out of word, worldly phenomenon that do happen. Um, obviously the power of prayer can work. Time in nature can help sometimes better than treatments, but treatments are obviously important. I'm not discounting treatments for anyone. Listening. But sometimes those uh, kind of existent, uh, some of those kind of uh, extraordinary kind of circumstances can be a little more healing than kind of conventional treatment, I think. So, yeah. But they're needed and, and they, they should supplement, I think, treatment of, of any type of illness out there. And what companies work with you um, as a result of kind of seeing your efforts I've, I saw that you have a lot of partnerships. You work with companies who believe in your mission, believe in your nonprofits work. So give a little taste as to who works with you and have they retrofitted you with some equipment uh, and watercraft to, to make sure that you can take more kids out on the water? Yes. So like I said before, when I um, started taking disadvantaged kids fishing, I couldn't fit Easton's wheelchair in my boat. So um, I went to Yellowfin and asked if they made like a handicapped boat or anything. And they were like, yeah, we can do that. So um, what Yellowfin did is I have a 21 foot Yellowfin and the console is actually pushed back a little bit. So a full size wheelchair can fit in the front. So I've taken, I think three or four people in a wheelchair. Um, and like the little kids, like Easton, like the four or five year olds, they can actually do donuts in the front of my boat. They'll unlock it. And one of them, his name was Bryce and he, or Bryson, and he started spinning in circles. He caught a fish and he's like, so excited i'm like dude you're making me dizzy i'm like lock yourself in we're good and he's like oh this is awesome i'm like oh my gosh so yellowfin they made um handicapped or wheelchair accessible boat um i'm sponsored by mercury power poles motor guide uh sign zoo with the wrap and sea deck with that little it looks like a yoga mat on my boat it's so comfortable. It is like a yoga mat on my boat. It's so comfortable. Um, and then I have Costa sunglasses, as you can tell from my Costa. tan lines. <laughs> yeah. And then I got Huck gear. We got these new Chastination shirts. And um, here's a little plug real quick. Um, the Chastination shirts, we're actually selling them. And the money from the shirts goes straight into the gas money to help take these kids fishing. That's incredible. That's awesome. Yeah. So we got that. Um, I got pin rod and reels, Abu Garcia for my freshwater side of things and Berkeley. We got mustad. We got spider wire. Gosh, I'm trying to like, well, I mean that that's an impressive list. You're, you're spot. <laughs> <laughs> that's real. Yeah, I think, thank you. I think that's it. Be super enviable that you have all those companies working with you, especially at such a young age, but it, it goes to show that they see a lot of promise and talent within you and they trust yeah. you and to, to work with you because there, there is a lot of liability, not saying, uh, it's bad, but a lot of companies look for influencers to work with and for them to put so much trust in you speaks to the fact that they recognize your talent, that your seriousness and what you bring to the table, because, Alternatively, those companies could work with some other, let's say, young promising woman, and she doesn't have, let's say, the same ethics or mission statement. So the fact that they've placed their trust in you is a great sign, and you should be very proud of yourself. Thank you. It hasn't hit me yet, but <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and I mean, because it is hard to kind of score those sponsorships, and I know we see this somewhat in the outdoor industry that some people are driven solely on the fact that, can I get these accolades? Can I get these sponsorships? And you don't seem to, to be the person to me, even though I've never met you personally, uh, to simply just seek out the sponsorships. I feel like they sought you out because they saw what work you're doing, how you're impacting 
Florida and the fishing community writ large. And I hope more companies do that rather than just look out for the celebrity. Yeah. So I get a lot of messages on Instagram. They're like, how did you get sponsored? I want to get sponsored. How did you do it? And I honestly, this, I don't even know how it happened. I just, I gave money back during a tournament and I got a sponsor by a beanbag company called Ocean Tamer and, it, and then Pin, um, Rod and Reels picked me up and it just kind of snowballed affected down. And the only company that I asked for something from is Yellowfin about the boat. And everyone else has contacted me. And like, um, if, if like something happened and every, like the fishing world just disappeared and poof gone, I would still take these kids fishing. Like I'm not in it for the sponsors or the whatever. I just want to take these kids fishing and I want other people to see it so they can do it just to get something good out there and get people, get kids outside. Cause nowadays everyone's inside and video games and someone said, um, tackle boxes, no Xboxes. Mm -hmm. like that that is good we need to do that <laughs> so if, if for some reason the fishing world just stopped like sponsor wise and following social media i'd still do it i don't i would still take kids fishing that goes to show um, that your motivations are pure and that you have good good intentions with with your mission statement because so many people i feel like this is a greater conversation we talk about this in the outdoor in fishing industry at large that so many people try to give a bad name to fishing and they get all the attention, all the bad kind of apples. But there are so many good apples like yourself who are just selfless. You could see it through your social media. Like even for those who formally, like you can see that you're the real deal. I'm not trying to <laughs> lick your chops or anything, but as someone who has you know, worked in media and I've interviewed a lot of people, you just come off really authentic and everyone knows your intentions are very pure. So you have much to be proud of and setting <laughs> is important, especially in your capacity as an influencer. And, and I think in your case, I think the term influencer is perfectly acceptable because that's what influencers should be doing. They shouldn't just be raking up followers and doing nothing with it. They should be yeah. using the platform they have, spreading goodness, paying it forward and inspiring people to take more people fishing, even without the limelight or even without the social media followers too. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it just feels good to do something good. Um, it's weird, but it's good. <laughs> Talk about your foray into fishing tournaments. You were alluding, I think, a little bit to that. So how did you get interested in that? And are there obstacles for women to go into tournament fishing? Because I never think I could ever do that. And I think I'm a little too old to get my start in tournament fishing. But no. to it, and, and what has been your experience so far? Um, so, uh, um, so after my first tournament, the one that I won and I gave the money back and all that good stuff. I picked up a couple sponsors and then I fished the Super Bowl of tournaments here is what we call it. Cause it's like a big tournament in Bradenton. It's called the Crossweight. And um, I was a sophomore going to be a junior. It was the summer of sophomore year. And my mom was like, yeah, you need to do this tournament. And I was like, yeah, totally. And then I like looked it up and I was like, oh no, that, that has a lot of people in it. I don't know. And my mom's like, well, get some of your friends together and see if they'll do it with you. So I picked up four friends. And I was like, you guys want to fish with me? Because they fish too. And they were like, uh, yeah. So I had an all-girls team in high school and we fished this tournament. And we walked into the captain's meeting and I was about to turn around and walk straight back out. It was so intimidating. Like we walk in, we're four, 15, 16 years old. So we're some high school girls walking in and there's the juniors, the junior boys, like the cool kids. And then there's the seniors, there's a couple sophomores. And it's just all like the cool kids from high school. And I'm like, and everybody stops talking. Like everyone's talking, we walk in and it just shoot, quiet. And I'm like, okay. Um, so we sit down and people start to talk again. They're like, oh, okay, whatever. They start talking again. And I hear a table over here and they're like, what is, what are they doing? They should, they should just go home. Like, why are they even here? They're, this is pointless for them. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess we're going home. So after the tournament, I told, I was, we were driving back. I told my friends, I'm like, I don't think we should fish this. I'm like, I know we just signed up, but we can say something came up. And one of my friends grabs me and she's like, we are fishing this, whether you like it or not. They're like, we are not going to give up. So we were in my room that night, rigging up all the rods and stuff. And um, one of the girls came over and grabbed our hands and she's like, we're going to get in circle and we're going to pray that we just 
catch a couple fish and we're just gonna have fun. And I was like, okay, yeah, okay, okay. So we got in a little circle and we fished and somehow we got first and third, first in the women's and third in the, yeah, and third in the overall juniors division. And when we walked up to weigh in those fish, oh my, the kids that were making fun of us, their jaw literally was like, <laughs> I was like, uh, hey, pick up your jaw, bud. And we weighed them in and they were like, oh, and I was like, we shouldn't fish it. But it's, it's very intimidating. It's especially, we were the first all girls team to fish that tournament. So <laughs> it's easy when someone's already done it and there's another girl there like, oh, cool. Yeah. What's up. But when you're the only one, it's like, I don't know what to do. Like, it's very intimidating, but it's worth it. Once you do it, it's worth it. It's definitely worth it. Would you say that it's been a welcoming experience? I think the fishing industry has involved, excuse me, evolved to the point where we see more women fishing. We see more branding and I really haven't had a, and I don't, I can't speak for every woman, but in my case, like I learned to fish from my dad and I started by the time I was eight and got seriously into it by the time I was 12. And he always made sure that I felt welcomed and anyone who was not accepting of him fishing with his daughter was kind of chewed out politely. Uh, but <laughs> I feel like there, there are some people who are like fogies who just can never accept the fact that women go fishing. And that's a really stupid mentality to have, but I think they're few and far between now, but I don't know from the term tournament circle circuit, but would you say that it's more welcoming? Are they, I know that they're creating more leagues for women. You were just at a, was it an FLW match recently? Talk about yeah, it. So now it's MLF. So it's, um, it's the BFL and it was in Lake Murray and there's one other girl that was fishing it. So it was me and my friend Anastasia and she's from South Carolina. So she fishes this tournaments a bunch and we were the only girl boaters there. So it's nice to have her there. And I was like, oh, thank goodness, another girl. And she's like, oh, thank you for finally doing this. And I'm like, sorry, it took me so long. <laughs> but it's, it's definitely, um, tournament wise, it has, I've seen a lot more girls. Like after that year we fished, there was another all girls team that came in and they were like a spit image of us last year. Like the captain was blonde. And then there were, there was one other blonde and then like two brunettes and that's exactly how my team looked and we're all looking at each other and we're like, we're the same exact thing. Like, this is so cool. And the girl came up and she's like, hey, I saw you fish it last year and you're why I'm fishing it this year. She's like, I was gonna do it, but I was just so scared because there were no girls doing it. And I'm like, oh, it's fine. I just did it. You can do it with us, let's go. But I've been teaching um, like expos. I used to travel around the state of Florida in high school and um, teach at Florida Sportsman Expos. And I would teach how to throw cast nets. That's like my thing. I got pink cast net and all that cool stuff. And I had, um, I saw this cute little boy. He was probably like four or five years old walking by. And I'm like, hey, do you want to throw the cast net and catch some candy? And he's like, candy? Yeah. The dad goes, no, he's not going to get taught by a girl. Oh. I said, I, I was like, hold on. I went and grabbed candy and I grabbed the cast net. And I said, do you want some candy? I, was t I totally ignored the dad. And I was talking to the kid. Cause he has his own voice. So I'm like, do you want to go catch some candy? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, that's what I thought. <laughs> and I'm like, are you serious? My mom's sitting there behind him. Like my mom, she used to go to the events and just kind of blend in and like, not really. This was when I was like 16. So I wasn't out of the nest yet. So she would just kind of blend in and just watch. And she was sitting behind that guy. And she's like, say one more thing. I dare you say one more thing. Mama bear is going to come out. And I'm like, oh, but I've had a couple people do that. They're like, well, I'm not going to get taught by a girl. And I'm like, okay, then you don't have to. You can keep moving along then. Don't, why, like, I don't know. It's I always just, hear from male, recently male fly fishing instructors. They're like, women are so much easier to teach. They <laughs> listen. And then when now we see with like more female captains and more female instructors, I think fewer people are chiding women for doing they're like i'm gonna seek you out because you're talented not because you're a woman not because you're yeah. a man, but because you can teach more delicately i guess like and we're more detail oriented like the yeah. reason you see our mutual friend debbie doing all these really great clinics teaching people um chart uh, charting people too people like what she offers and i bet that's the same for many women and i know you were on angie's podcast recently she takes people out uh, for charters so it's like it's people seeking out great captains and if they happen to be women it's a bonus and it's it's a good thing that people are looking to that they're like you know i i would 
maybe I want to have a little change. I don't want to simply just go with the conventional lecture. Maybe there's someone else out there offering something unique, yeah. same traditional tactics, but with a different twist. And I think people seek that out because they like the people behind the classes, the clinics, the, the fishing charters. And it's a good thing that more and more women are now kind of leading these efforts. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And I've heard that like women are more patient. Yes. Like when taking these kids fishing, I'm like, okay, do you need help casting? They're like, no, I got it. And they'll cast and get into a tree. And I'm like, it's okay. And I've had like the parents on the boat and they're like, how do you not just explode? And I'm like, I'm like, are you out on the water? You just got to be calm and I'll just undo it and keep going. And they're like, how? And I'm like, I really don't know. <laughs> it's just, you just got to have patience. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's a maxim overall for fishing. You, you do have to have patience or else you're not going to get a fish. Sometimes yeah as we all know through our fishing experiences sometimes like 30 minutes into the trip you may just be hitting the right spots you may be hooking in fish sometimes it may take the last 30 minutes too until you're successful or maybe you have a bad day on the water but it's still a bad day on the water is still a good day of fishing in a sense uh, better working at your office job or, or what used to be working at your office job I would say but it's like you get to it's an all-encompassing experience people forget that it's not just catching the fish it's catching a sunrise or a sunset it's making memories with the people on board it's yeah. cool wildlife or seeing some cool weather patterns like I remember uh the tarpon trip I had at the conclusion of it there was this big storm in in St. Pete and we got soaking wet and we had a great day on the water we lost a lot of great fish but we came away from laughing at that moment, getting soaked. And it was just so memorable. So you yeah. take everything that comes with the trip. And yeah, it, it, yeah patience is certainly a requirement to, to do it. And, and when I teach people kind of informally how to fish, because up here it's a little different where you can have access to water, but I don't have my own boat. So I can't take people out fishing in that respect. But I can take people like on the shore, like to the local urban spots, um, if we rent a charter, we can do that. But in the small experience that I have been a being able to do that, I just try to be patient and be like, I'll help you distangle this. I'll help you with this. Like, don't worry. It's like, I'm sorry, I'm screwing up. Kind of like in your yeah. experience, I'm like, no, it's okay. Like, that's why I'm here to help you. I want you to catch a fish. Like, I'll help you like set everything up and you just have to reel the rod. That's it. And I'll be there with the net to help you catch a fish too. And you yeah. have patient. You can't get angry at people like, we were there in that position early on in our fishing careers. Like I remember having the snags, getting things tangled, all that. So it's like, I was in that position. I was naive and I had my dad or other people and they taught me how to be better. And that's what we can do. Passing it forward to people, just being patient. And it, it there's no reason to get angry while fishing, unless someone is really doing something very dangerous. You don't yeah. want to be angry while you're going fishing. Yeah, exactly. And um, are you doing some more tournaments despite COVID? I know you probably have more of an interest. Do you have any events coming up where you're going to be taking more kids out fishing? Any kind of big projects or anything you're working on? Um, so tournament-wise, I am fishing tournaments. I'm fishing the BFLs up in South Carolina. Um, now, saltwater tournament-wise, there haven't really been a lot because it's been cold here for us. So... <laughs> It's in like 60, which is cold. So <laughs> we're, kind of, we're kind of, uh, our tournaments are like in the summertime. So hopefully we'll get some more then. Um, but yeah, I've actually ran out of kids to take fishing. I've taken them all. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm looking for some more kids to take fishing and just get them out there. I've, yeah, I've exhausted them all. <laughs> also take kids from out of state or just specifically in Florida? Um, I do specifically in Florida. I've ha I have had some fly into Florida, like they're on vacation and they're like, yeah, we want to go fishing with you. I'll be like, okay. So it's specifically Florida. Yeah. Well, yeah. if I hear of any kids or families with kids needing to go fishing, I will send them your way. <laughs> if they're Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But is there any other type of thought you want to input uh, for this broadcast, anything that you want to leave my listeners and our watchers to with anything inspirational that you have, or some sort of words of wisdom you want to leave? Um, oh yeah. Okay. So this is like my favorite quote. Like I have it in my room. So when I wake up in the morning, it's like right there and I read it every morning. It says, I'm not telling you it's going to be easy, but I'm telling you it's going to be worth it, 
which is literally this entire, like my life. Cause it's not easy. Like being an the only girl and all that, it's not easy, but it will be worth it. And it's starting to be worth it. It's you are making a tremendous impact. You've obviously been recognized on TV. I think I messaged you when I said I, or I commented on one of your posts. I was like, I saw you on discovery channel recently. I was like, I <laughs> and you've gotten a lot of notice and I hope more people, I hope others like me, podcasters, people with platforms can bring you on to share your story because I feel like we have a lot of the same narratives circulated and it gets boring all the time. So it's like, you're doing something unique. It's unifying. People can look to you for inspiration and, and how to give back because that's the thing you can do, especially in tough times. Like the best way to really make an impact is just to pay it forward, accept yeah. kindness, take people fishing. And you're doing a tremendous job. You don't need me to say that, but I, I want to applaud you for all the work you're doing. You. At some point, hopefully post COVID or maybe sometime in the future, I may be coming to Florida in a few weeks. I'm not sure, but <laughs> kind of in, in your region. But at some point in time, I would love to connect with you in future. Maybe we can go fishing together and I would love to film you even more like your story, uh, yeah. kind of get that out there a little bit more, but I hope we can connect in the future. And where can people connect with you on social media? So I have um, an Instagram, it's Chastin Nation on Instagram, Facebook, and my YouTube channel. It's Chastin Nation Fishing on YouTube. So yeah, those are my main platforms. That's awesome. Chastin, it has been such a pleasure chatting with you. We've gone from everything from tarpon fishing to how to give back to dipping your feet into tournament fishing. And I hope people take away so much from what you've said here on our conversation today. Continue the great job. Hopefully you're going to inspire more people and I hope we can meet in the future at some point. Thank, Thank you so, you so much. Thank you.